A lot of the conversation surrounding regenerative agriculture lacks nuance. Not today's episode. Dawn Equipment CEO Joe Bassett talks plainly about some of the challenges and opportunities in helping farmers build healthier soils. I postulate this argument as like the regenerative ladder, right? Like farmers are starting here and then, you know, so many well-intentioned people in the industry are like, why don't you just no-till? And it's like, okay, well, you're not empathizing with their real needs as their business. Joe's perspective is rooted in practicality. He says some of the regenerative rhetoric out there turns farmers off rather than empowering them to improve their operations. There's a lot of non-crazy reasons why farmers would not adopt practices like that, but it's not impossible and it can definitely be done. And the space in between is an engineered solution. And that's where I want to be. Joe and his company make equipment for farmers all along this regenerative ladder or pyramid, as we'll also refer to it, from starting to reduce tillage all the way up to a stock cropper, which is an autonomous pen for livestock or poultry that slowly moves down the field between rows of crops. If you're going to scale up regenerative agriculture, you need to have something that produces a predictable outcome. Hello, fellow ag nerds. Thanks so much for joining me for today's episode of the Future of Agriculture podcast. My name is Tim Hamrich, and if you're interested in where innovative ideas meet practical realities in food production, you have found the right show. As you probably gathered already from our intro, we've got a great episode for you here today. Joining me is Joe Bassett, president and CEO of Dawn Equipment Company. Dawn makes smart soil engaging products, enabling farmers to plant seeds more precisely and prepare the soil with greater efficiency while using less fertilizer. They specifically focus on row crops like corn and soybeans. You also hear us mention their sub-brand Underground Agriculture, which aims to provide cost-effective products for regenerative agriculture, making several novel mechanical devices that empower farmers to maximize profit through healthy soil and cover crops. Joe strikes a great balance here between the hope and optimism of regenerative agriculture, as well as the realities that adoption of these practices has been slow and well-intentioned programs can try to push these practices on farmers without really empowering them to integrate them into their business in a way that makes sense. I really think this is a conversation worth your time, especially as so many people out there are wanting to sort of choose sides on these issues without considering the realities. Dawn Equipment was started by Joe's father, Jim, and two partners in 1992. Joe studied physics at the University of Iowa and joined the company in 2003, eventually taking over in 2015. He founded Underground Agriculture in 2019. Diving into today's conversation, Joe starts things off with a bit of an overview of the company. We specialize in ground engaging products, and we make smart ground engaging products that are for planting, fertilizer application, and tillage, and we increasingly make you know, unique ground engagement products for cover crops from regenerative agriculture. But everything is sort of focused around minimum tillage, no-till, strip till, and increasingly like as you climb up the sort of ladder of regenerative practices, you know, you get into ever more complex no-till situations. But we've also been um getting into sort of robotic applications on the planter front too. We make uh, systems that completely automate every adjustment that a farmer would have traditionally made on a corn planter. We make several unique technologies that are active control products that control how hard the machines are pushing on the ground as you go through the field. We utilize those on our strip till product lines. And so really our focus is ground engagement, but we're in this sort of process where we're reconfiguring the company to sort of move into more of an OEM space as opposed to an attachment market. Very cool. And, you know, Dawn Equipment's been around a long time. Why the different branding with the underground ag? You know, this comes up again and again. I think I might actually undo that, to be quite honest, because it's producing too much confusion in the market. Originally, I had thought, and it's true, that in the really 
hardcore cover crop community, people that are using cover crops as a primary mode of weed control and not just, you know, the sort of run of the mill integration of cover crops into crop systems that a lot of people do, which frankly, I don't really believe do a whole lot for the soil or the health of the soil. The farm consumer for the underground agriculture product line is somebody who might very well be roller crimping when they're planting. And it's such a small, specific group that is really quite different than the mainstream farmers that we're targeting with the Dawn Equipment brand that we wanted to speak to them with a different brand. Also, that brand has sort of a different ideology as the Dawn Equipment brand becomes more automated. Like pretty soon, every ground engaging row unit that we make in the Dawn brand will be computer controlled in some way or another. And as you see kind of increasing digitization and those sort of smart ground engaging products, the customer for the underground agriculture product line is a different customer. Those products are focused around simplicity and low cost mechanical solutions, basic mechanical tools for regenerative agriculture that reduce complexity. So those farmers tend to be smaller farms. They tend to be spending less money on equipment. They view themselves ideologically as being different than mainstream farmers. And as you see those products and practices becoming more and more mainstream, which they are, it's a very small market. It is growing. I think we probably will end up actually unwinding that and wrapping them both into a single brand just because people are confused by it. Yeah, well, and also it does kind of represent what you're saying, which is it's it's small, but it's becoming more mainstream. And so I guess it might make sense that you would go from, you know, a different brand into maybe one unified brand along with that. Yeah, I mean, not as fast as you would think. If you go around for all of the talk about cover crops and carbon sequestration and regenerative agriculture, I'm increasingly sort of cynical about what the true rate of adoption is. And I don't think people are being effective or they're misunderstanding the problem. All of the sort of hand wringing that goes on trying to get farmers to change their practices hasn't really gone anywhere. And it's just going to be a long evolutionary process that has to grow organically. And, you know, in the absence of real policy shifts, which I don't know are necessarily going to really materialize. Yeah. OK, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because this is definitely something I wanted to talk to you about, uh, because, yeah, I think, the you know, what's been reported as far as just cover crop adoption is something in the neighborhood of like five percent or less. And, you know, if, if that is the gateway drug to other soil health building practices, then that doesn't make one think that we're in the middle of a massive conversion that's happening quickly. In your opinion, and you mentioned policy. What are the barriers to making that happen? Assuming that we're not going to get the stick, that it has to be more the carrot. What is going to help kind of pave that way? Because right now, what I'm hearing from people is just like throw money at the problem. And I don't know. It's hard for me to think that it's so one dimensional that it's just like, hey, give me some money and and I'll change the way I farm. It seems more complicated than that to me, but I'm I'm curious to get your take. No, I think it is that. I mean, a lot of it has to do with also just age dynamics in the farming community, too, where you have, you know, my average customer that's making a buying decision might be 45 to 55. Look, I mean, they're doing things. Their businesses are sustainable, right? A lot of these farms have been in business a long time and they're making money in the system as it exists today. And why would you do something that's incredibly risky some people do want to be the experimenter and, and out there and risking failure. And those are the people that are adopting right now. But it is financial because the reality is that if yield pays the bills, a lot of farmers are not sold by this argument that they're going to you know, not really have a yield loss when they embrace cover crops. And when you just talk about embracing cover crops, that's a pretty broad term. I mean... You know, you, you go out in the fall and you plant some cover crops and or you fly it on with an airplane and then you come back in the spring and you kill it early enough that 
it dies and then it's like pretty mainstream system. But the farmers that we're looking at are doing a range of practices which are vastly riskier or that the perceived risk is really high. So they're making money. The market is set up in a way that is profitable for them right now. We have to accept that like farms are businesses. These are financial decisions. And I think a lot of people don't empathize with the extent to which these are just businesses making business decisions. And you have to really make an argument that this is going to be a more profitable long-term strategy for a particular farm. And that's easier said than done. But the positive thing is, I think that there's a lot of mechanical innovation that can happen. So when you talk about the types of cover crop practices that we're getting into, it's people that are at the bare minimum in the underground agriculture product line planting green, right? So they've got they've got something green out there living when they're planting. And then they're going to roller crimp either at the time of planting or after planting and so on and so forth, right? Okay, so there's a lot of non-crazy reasons why farmers would not adopt practices like that because it is going to make it harder to produce the same yield objective as you would get with a conventional type of system. But it's not impossible and it can definitely be done. And the space in between is an engineered solution. And that's where I want to be because, okay, do we ever believe that in the Midwest, there could be a situation like existed on the East Coast for years where in some areas of the Carolinas and Maryland and other places, farmers could be getting paid $75 an acre to adopt certain types of cover crop practices. Well, that really changes it. Now, paying them $20 an acre isn't going to change it, right? So there's like a spread somewhere in between you're going to get them. But I'm kind of torn on whether or not just essentially paying farmers to adopt practices is really the best thing because as soon as the money goes away, do they really have any reason to stay with it or will they just kind of fall back into you know, whatever the status quo is. And I think that there is a certain body of evidence that shows that they do as soon as that money goes away. Well, I think that's what you're saying kind of comes into if the equipment is there and the money helps them get over the hesitation of purchasing the equipment, but it works, you know, then I think you're a lot more likely for someone to stick with it, I would think. Right. And we're getting there. I mean, we get into some pretty far out systems where there's perennial cover crops or systems where they're leaving the cover crop in a living state throughout the crop cycle. And those are really the high risk systems. But I'll tell you one thing, okay, growing soybeans in a cereal rye roller crimp system is very low risk. That's the easy spot. Okay, we can do that and produce pretty uniform results. And that's a system where you might go from multiple herbicide passes down to a single herbicide pass, right? So if you look at a, a soybean system with a single herbicide pass where you're you're using a thick mat of cereal rye to control weeds and so on and so forth, that's a well understood system that there's no reason why you won't see that scaling higher and higher because the results are there and it's relatively straightforward to accomplish. When you start getting into corn systems, everything just gets a lot more complex. But there's reason for optimism. I mean, if, if you look at how many acres of soybeans are grown in this country, that's a hell of a lot of acres. And if you say, okay, let's just punt on corn for right now and just talk about soybean acres, that moves the needle a lot. And there's a lot of opportunities too, because you know when you're planting a bean, which wants to be planted this deep into a mat of residue, which is you know this thick, there's a range of engineered solutions that you need in order to get a good result with it. And we've got a lot of that all worked out. But, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, those products are really growing. They're starting from a small point, but they are growing. Well, let's talk about the automation thing a little bit here, because I think you brought up an interesting point, which is probably obvious to you, but maybe not to everybody listening, that 
automation doesn't have to mean you take the driver out of the tractor. There's a lot of processes that can be automated, you know, in a planter, for example. So can you maybe talk about the type of automation you all are kind of bringing to farmers? Yeah, I mean, I, I look at the litany of vehicle robotic solutions that are on the market that you just see one after the other of like this robot and this robot and this robot. And then you look at what they're doing to the soil and it is just retrograde, low innovation stuff. Or there's all of these uh, European cultivating robots that are out now. I mean, I know that they're solving for a use case, but is that really the best we can do? And that's another big worry for me is that because the focus is so much on, you know, the guidance of the vehicle, on the driving power platform, that you can imagine a future which actually is moving conservation agriculture backwards with automation, because all of a sudden, just the human cost of doing the tillage and doing the work is no longer there. So why not just do more of it? It's easy. Kind of there's a variety of just technology stacks that people will clip onto an existing tractor these days. And, oh, what's the easiest thing to automate? Well, tillage. Okay. Well, it's this time consuming thing that you got to have somebody out there doing it. And it's very simple because the machines don't require a lot of adjustment and so on and so forth. Well, that, that could move us backwards. And so really our focus is intelligent row units, intelligent ground engaging devices, which I think in the future, people are going to realize, wait, we've got these autonomous vehicles, but we need an interesting range of automation in the actual ground engaging elements to go with it to truly do interesting things with autonomy. Like, um, in the, the reflex planter automation technology system, we have not only automated downforce, but we have automated seed depth control. You have active depth closing wheel control and things like that, where you can actually be changing how deep the seed is planted as you go through the field. There is going to be a new planter row unit coming from us soon that will build in a lot of those active control systems into that. and. I mean, that's just our, our sweet spot. Frankly, making a vehicle drive along a path through a field, I think is not actually very complex and it doesn't require very much. As you get into sort of the higher order of magnitude, machine vision systems and truly systems that produce safety or allow the vehicle to have more of sensory perception of the environment around it in the farm, well, then that's going to require some sort of deeper, harder tech. But a lot of these robots that are on the market, I don't think are super complicated, actually, and don't have very high barriers to entry. You know, that's just not our race. We have to be clear about who we are and what we're doing as a company, which is ground engagement and making it smarter and smarter and smarter. Although we have been kind of getting into the stock cropper robot, which the way that that fits in is I postulate this argument as like the regenerative ladder, right? Like farmers are starting here and then, you know, so many well-intentioned people in the industry are like, why don't you just no-till? Why don't you just use this? And it's like, okay, well, you're not empathizing with their real needs as their business and you're not understanding how they perceive a change to their cropping system. And so let's not try and move them in a big, huge leap all at once, let's move them in steps along the way towards a farming system that improves the soil ideally over time. So we got into the roller crimping and then um, we realized, okay, well, establishment of cover crops is a big deal. So then we got into the intro row CD. And then we said from there, let's start looking at living mulch systems. For instance, systems where you're trying to grow corn with essentially zero fertilizer and control weeds, like organic no-till. That's the top of the pyramid in regenerative farming because you're getting this high value organic crop out of it that is worth more and you're paying the absolute least into it. Because again, my entire theory was, okay, how do we maximize the financial outcome for the end users? And then that is going to translate into adoption. Because again, it is 
purely a financial decision on their part. So let's ask the question, how do farmers make the most amount of money and then work backwards from there? Well, what farming system would per acre produce the maximum amount of income? It's like a differential equation because you, at some point, you have to kind of look at yield versus the selling price of the grain versus the input cost and so on and so forth. And because, you know, in many cases, you're you're essentially making the argument that you're going to make more money by yielding less, which everything about the conversation in farming is all about yield, you know, yield wins, right? And not empathizing with that argument is a big mistake people make because you know what? Yield does win. Yield does make money, especially now when You have five dollar corn and out into next year, right? I mean, how do you make the argument to a guy? Oh, you just gave up four bushels to the acre on something. Well, that's twenty dollars to your acre for four bushels. Meanwhile, X Y Z Conservation Group is over here trying to like say, oh, here's your twenty dollars to grow your cover crops. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. We have to be thinking of like radically different solutions. The farming systems that they're using today, which have not changed a whole lot over the past fifty years. Are reliable. That's why they keep doing it. You go out there, you do some tillage in the fall, you come back, you do some more in the spring, you put some fertilizer on this way and you do this and you can get a pretty predictable outcome. You know, if you're going to scale up regenerative agriculture, you need to have something that produces a predictable outcome. And so in corn, we definitely have not had that. In fact, we've had a lot of really sort of failures for lack of a better word. But I basically got to the point where I was like, you know what? We're never really going to succeed with ultra low input corn production. We're never going to succeed with this strategy of how do we make the most money per unit of space in the field without having animals in the equation somewhere. So the idea is that you would move to a wider sort of row spacing or an intercrop system. Imagine a field where you had like four rows or six rows of 30 inch corn, then you had four rows or six rows of cover and so on and so forth, where you're sort of maximizing the sort of light accessibility of the plants. But then you're using these solar powered robots, the stock cropper robot to move between the rows They're eating the cover crop, making a healthy, saleable meat product, ideally, or a poultry product or eggs. And you're just creating that closed loop for the manure and the animal byproducts inside of the field, which for organic farms, manure is a huge cost. Manure is like one of the hardest engineering problems in agriculture, I think, because it has low perceived value and it has a lot of volume. It's expensive to truck and to move places. And so, like, let's use the animals as a machine that basically takes nutrients and puts them into a manure form that then will feed back into the soil biology and amp up the soil health at a much, much faster rate. I don't personally believe you're ever going to produce truly high performing soil without animal byproducts or grazing in the system somewhere. And so that's how we got to the top of the pyramid for a um, grain production system, I think, is the stock cropper. But that's like dumb low tech. So it's a self-contained solar powered pen, basically, that will move down a row at a certain rate, right? Yep. It creeps along. It has its own rainwater collection system feeding system in it and it just you know moves um you know in a self-guided way through the field and um it actually generates excess energy it will generate a lot more energy than it uses over time and so there's a lot of other interesting sort of ways you could imagine a future farm which was electrified which would harness that excess energy which is being generated by the stock cover because if you put them with enough density it's essentially a uh a solar farm that's also a barn. Right. In the real farm sense, not in the solar farm sense. Yeah, that's really cool. And so, you know, I like the pyramid because one of the questions I had for you is like, where do you focus on the ladder? Do you focus on the very bottom of the ladder or the very top? And I imagine the pyramid probably represents sort of where you would focus as a company that, you know, you've really got to invest a lot in that base because that's where the higher volume of customers are versus the the top of the pyramid. Is that right? Correct. 
some of those product lines are really growing and they're going to be nice businesses. But my objective for the company is to scale the company and grow John Equipment into a much, much bigger company over the next five to 10 years. And because of that, we have to be sort of practical about the decisions we make and targeting big businesses with big addressable markets. And I frankly love the idea of selling smart, ground engaging products to more or less mainstream farmers in big markets. You know, a high speed corn planter row unit that's automated, I can sell to any farmer on earth, essentially. But you don't have to be educating them or having them massively change their farming practices in order to adopt your product. They can just put it on what they into what they do. And as long as we offer a great product with a great value proposition to them, we can build that to scale on top of. So what I think we will be doing will actually work and will help farmers adopt and will help farmers change with practical hardware solutions. And you see this litany of products in the sort of carbon markets and carbon ecosystems and regenerative this and regenerative that, that literally do not address the main problem that real farms have. I don't understand where it comes from. I don't understand what people are even thinking in some of these businesses that have raised massive amounts of money. They're further up this sort of carbon food chain. But you're not solving for the real problem that real farmers are having, which is how do I make this work on my farm? How do I do this? I got to go out to a field and I got to do something in order to do this. Well, how do I do that? I think it's a fair assessment. I do. For you as an entrepreneur, though, you have to somehow keep yourself optimistic about the future. And I I do see reasons to be cynical about some of the things that are going on right now. What's keeping you optimistic? What's kind of keeping you excited about the future for where Dawn is going? Well, I mean, first of all, there's there's nobody in agriculture more optimistic than me. Like optimism is the fuel that runs my engine. I mean, it, it basically has to, because if you're not optimistic, what are you going to do? I personally am motivated by climate issues. I come from a physics background and I tend to like think of problems in terms of like black box solutions. And I do believe like we have these incredible machines for taking in carbon dioxide and like put it into the soil and they're called plants. And I think that there is an incredible answer there. And we can imagine a future, which is a vastly better future, a future that builds the health of the soil and produces cleaner water and produces healthier food and produces all sorts of things. And I, I do believe in that. I've bootstrapped for almost two decades. And as we seek to scale the company, I am probably going to end up taking someone else's money for the first time. But one of the things about owning 100% of this company and bootstrapping it to this level is that I make a product and I sell it to the farmers. I have to be in alignment with the farmers. There's nobody else's voice at the table. And if you're in a business and really your objective is almost to fulfill the needs of your investors, well, the investors' needs and the reality of the farmers and the market in the field might be completely misaligned. And I think that when you look at something like soil health and the process of sequestering carbon, the real rate of change that you're going to produce a result in the Midwest, in the I states and Minnesota and the Dakotas and Nebraska, I mean, is going to be slower. Like earlier in my career, I was continually overestimating how fast the industry was changing. And in reality, like you're not going to produce sweeping change to the way farms operate that quickly. I mean, the way that most farms operate today is not vastly different than the way they operated 60 or 70 years ago. The equipment is like bigger and like drives itself, but it's not really that different. Yeah. The process is pretty similar. Yeah. I mean, so you're talking about really sweeping change. Well, okay. How do we produce really sweeping change? We're only going to do that if they make way more money doing it. But that is an actual mechanical hardware solution. And 
to close loop on the previous conversation, I just don't think people are truly understanding the problem. Or there's like such an excess of funding further up the sort of carbon market food chain. And it's like, how do you make these things work without accomplishing the sort of lower order stuff that farms need to succeed? So it's like, okay, you can build out a marketplace and build out all this other stuff. But it's like what happened in Ukraine a few years ago. Like Ukraine has just amazing soil. Okay. The only place you'll see soil like Ukraine is in little swaths of northern Iowa and southern Minnesota where you have like deep black soil. There you have no regulatory framework whatsoever. Like they still moldboard plow. Lemkin sells all these like moldboard plows and they just like turn it over. And that's that's like still the status quo. And 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, well-intentioned no-till people went over to Ukraine and they're like, oh, come on, guys, you're like plow, disc, and harrowing this entire country. You got to do something different. They tried to get people to no-till and they went in, they're like, okay, fine, we'll no-till. And like, they weren't really set up right. It just completely like crash and burned. And then everyone's like, see, I told you so. And then you've lost that opportunity to try for another essentially generation. Because a farmer that's been like, oh, see, it didn't work to now get them to try and make that move to change their practices again and take another swing at the bat is really hard. So I guess the point I'm making is that it's possible that not having super rapid adoption right away is not a bad thing. Because if we try and like scale up cover crops and regenerative practices, not just like normal run-of-the-mill BS cover crops, like real cover crop farming, before we really have the systems in place to produce success, that could be worse than doing nothing because we might actually lose the ability to get some farmers to adopt for a substantial amount of time. Yeah, a generation in some cases, yeah. In preparation for this interview, I listened to your interview with Jared McDaniel, and you talked about how before you came back to the family business, they went through a hard time where they actually kind of had to scale way back down to four people. And so I I guess my question is, it sounded like part of the, the reason for that is they were making a great product, but maybe the market just wasn't ready for it yet or was a little bit ahead of its time. Do you think about that a lot? And how does that maybe guide your approach today if that's true maybe you could recharacterize it if it's not well in one sense i am about to come out with a new planter again but at that time there wasn't a lot of in-house manufacturing the product was largely made other places that's something that's completely different is that we make everything we make our own compact hydraulic actuation systems we make our own embedded controllers we develop our own software we develop our own user interfaces we machine all of our own stuff we make everything And I think that the key to not repeating that failure, which, you know what, failure when you're somebody like Joe and you're a small to mid-sized manufacturing company in agriculture is something that I simply just live with the sort of existential issues that go on with that. And I more or less am okay with living in this sort of perpetual existential fear, you know, because what's the worst that's going to happen? We only get one life. And we got to try and do something big. And I got to try and do something really great and really beautiful too. And we have to make beautiful products. And to a certain extent, the farmers have rewarded us. Definitely need to not overcook it on the R&D. That's easy to do. But to be quite honest, that planter in the mid-90s, there were sales. The problem was not that there was not sales or demand. The problem was just running out of runway. And the one thing I really need to do that I'm spending more and more time doing right now is thinking about finance, thinking about the fact that like, okay, to really grow the business the way I want to is simply going to take a lot of money. But the beautiful thing that I've done now is we've developed an incredible range of technologies using only our own cash flow. And the products are sorted and ready to go. 
And now I can take in capital to the company and have a very clear value proposition where it's like, we're not going to do R&D with your money. We've got some sorted out products that all we need to do is just simply make more of them. You know, who knows? I mean, look, Dawn Equipment's been around for nearly 30 years and for being typically regarded as the most eccentric and crazy companies in the industry, we've outlived a lot of other people. And the reason we've outlived a lot of other people is an uncompromising commitment to quality and an uncompromising commitment to the end user. And so what is success? Well, every day that I wake up and get to invent farm equipment with this incredible team and make something in this country and have a factory and make parts and design something and sell it to an end user and go out and see it working in the field. Like every day I get to do that is, is a good day. And I feel truly fortunate that I get to be a professional inventor. And if I'm not being super risk-taking and trying to run it on that sort of knife edge, then I'm sort of failing. And long story short, kind of seeing as a teenager, the company kind of go broke It really impacted me, but I reflect on this with my wife all the time. It doesn't actually change my risk tolerance or the way that I run the business. I'm actually naturally disposed to do exactly the same type of things and to step up to the plate and take another swing at the bat and uh, try it again. Like look at the regenerative agriculture space. How much money have I invested into like these products and so on and so forth? Like sometimes you got to be out on the whim. And it's just about core conviction. I truly believe that given enough time, the market's going to come our way and we're going to be in the right place with it. And arguably that's already happening. I bet within the next year, there's going to be people at Dawn Equipment that are like sort of traditional looking business people. And that will be good, but we just have to never lose sight of our values. Man, some really great perspective there on many topics. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Thank you so much to Joe Bassett for being on today's show. I knew it was a good interview when we talked for well over an hour, and I still hadn't got even halfway through my pre-interview notes. I told Joe we'll have to have him back for a round two at some point to talk about manufacturing and distribution as an independent farm equipment company. So we'll have to save that one for another time. If these soil-related topics interest you, I do want to give a quick plug here for another podcast you could check out that I host called Soil Sense. Uh, The premise of that show that I do with NDSU soil health specialist Dr. Abby Wick is that building healthier soils is not just about prescribing practices. It's about finding the right people to collaborate with to help you along the journey. You can subscribe to that by searching for Soil Sense on whatever podcast platform you're listening to me right now on. Thanks so much for your time and your attention. I don't take it lightly. I'll be back next week with another story of ag innovation. 